Welcome to this introduction to fake news. In this video, I'm going to talk about why we should care about fake news, consider some of the reasons it takes hold, look at some of the key issues you should be aware of, and offer some guidance on how to combat fake news. We'll learn how to make better decisions about information so you can feel confident that you know how to assess sources properly. We'll look at this mainly from the perspective of news articles, but the tools and techniques you'll learn about will be applicable to all sorts of information, from essays to articles, YouTube videos, lectures, podcasts and official reports. This guide without audio is on the School Library's Instagram account at King School Library, so you can save it in Instagram if you prefer. Let's get started. You have such a vast amount of information at your fingertips. How do you know what information is trustworthy or reliable? You may think it doesn't really matter if you don't know if the information you're reading has come from an expert. You may think it's only important when you're looking for academic information. But the impact of poor quality information can be widely felt with the online spread of conspiracy theories, anti-rational attitudes and paranoia undermining society and democracy around the world. We've probably all seen the very human impact of disinformation with the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as other areas like climate change and violent extremism. By reading poor quality information, you're feeding your brain information that can mislead or divert, which is significant when we talk about confirmation bias later. You're also telling your web browser to prioritise that sort of information in future searches, limiting the quality of your future information consumption. And you're giving your support and seal of approval to an information provider that doesn't deserve it bypassing more ethical providers who might appreciate the support instead. Good quality information is key in advancing health, gender equality, education, jobs and the environment amongst many other social goods. So it really is important in a very broad understanding of life. If you're watching this video in class, pause to take a test to see how easily you can spot fake news. When we think about fake news and the serious repercussions it can have, we might think about things like political upheavals, Cambridge Analytica, Brexit, Trump, the far right's extreme ideology, anti-immigration and racist beliefs, QAnon, Covid disinformation and hate. People blame Russia or Twitter or Google or Facebook for the problems associated with fake news. But I want you to think a little differently about these sorts of things, less polarised. Fake news tends to take hold most when people are angry. Angry because governments haven't supported them as they'd like to be supported, like big corporations and tax havens or organisations making a profit to supply inadequate food parcels to kids who go hungry. Vast numbers of people may believe the sort of fake news that QAnon puts out because they feel the system's against them in some way. It probably is, just not in the form of lizard people or Hillary Clinton eating babies. Fake news and conspiracy theories give voice to people who feel that they're not being listened to and allows them to apportion blame. The best antidote to fake news might not be to belittle those who believe it, to argue for greater scepticism, to fine those who publish or enable it to spread, or to completely ban disinformation online and heavily police content uploaded. Instead, maybe we need to work towards a more fair, equal and transparent society that doesn't polarise its citizens or make them feel powerless to direct their own lives. How do you make sure news or research that you read is true? And there's no judgment here. Do you regularly visit a broadly trustworthy news provider or research database and trust their long-standing reputation? Do you go to the same sources as your teacher, your parent or your peers? Do you read a variety of viewpoints on a story? Or do you just go with what feels right? 
How do you guard against a generally trustworthy provider getting it wrong every once in a while? Or standards slipping over time? How do you think independently and not just consume the same media that those around you do? You might like to pause the video here to comment in class. I hate to break it to you, but our attention and our rational thought, our minds are deeply flawed and often shouldn't be trusted. People who believe in lizard people taking over the world or a paedophile ring in a Washington pizza restaurant are irrational, but we're all irrational to some degree because that's how our brains work. We're programmed to see what we're looking for. If you've ever taken a selective attention test, like the invisible gorilla test, you'll probably have experienced this yourself. We are constantly bombarded by an endless array of internal and external stimuli, thoughts and emotions. So we've had to develop the ability to focus on what we think is important while blocking out the rest. Often this can mean we prioritise looking for what we expect to see or what we're guided to look for. Our intuition would tell us that we'd notice when something as big and distinctive as a person in a gorilla suit walks into a group of people playing catch and beats their chest at us. But our intuition is consistently proved wrong. And to add to that, Photos and video media significantly increase our susceptibility to fake news. You are far more likely to believe a false claim merely because a photo is present. Because in the moment, we think a photo can't lie, it's proof. But we all know that photos absolutely can lie. They can be edited, they can be cropped, they can be taken at an entirely different event and time and reused inappropriately. Videos can be deep fakes. The quality of these deepfakes is evolving and improving all the time. The long and short of it is, unfortunately, our brains are hardwired to believe fake news. If you found an image on social media and are not sure if the story about it is true, what can you do? You might like to pause to comment in class here. A common technique for those creating misleading or fake news is to use images to build the confidence of their readers. These images are very often stolen from elsewhere. When checking the reliability of a news article or a post you've seen on socials, think like an investigative journalist and check the image to corroborate the story. Here is an example of an image online involving Barack Obama, Hugo Chavez, and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. If we paste the image into a reverse image search tool like tineye.com, we can see matches from across the internet. So you can see what's happened here. It's a composite image from these two photographs. Sometimes the image looks exactly the same and hasn't been doctored, but perhaps it's purporting to depict an event on a particular day or in a particular place but Tinai can show you the same image posted earlier in time or connected to a different location or event, like using the sort by oldest feature. So you can infer from that that the image is not representing what it says it is representing. Here's a top tip. If the news story doesn't cite the source, and yes, I'm referring to referencing here, so if it doesn't tell you who the photographer was, and where and when the photo was taken. It's not good journalism, so the author's probably not a trustworthy journalist. That's not to say that the story isn't accurate or the author isn't genuine, just that you need to do some more work to corroborate the story from another, more reliable source or from multiple unrelated sources. There's a well-known saying, people won't remember what you say but they'll remember how you made them feel. And we can apply that to research and to the news. If it feels right, we tend to believe it. But just because something feels right doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Consider these ways in which we can be misled by our own minds, often but not exclusively online. Echo chambers 
are social spaces in which ideas, opinions and beliefs are reinforced by repetition within a closed group. Filter bubbles are when users are suggested content based on their previous online interests, leading them to become separated from information that di disagrees with their viewpoint. Emotional manipulation refers to appealing to people's emotions rather than getting them to think things through. These are all techniques that can impinge on our ability to experience and assess the world around us. There's a fascinating memoir by Tara Westover called Educated. In it, she recalls her childhood. Brought up by Mormon parents who homeschooled their children, Tara learned herbal medicine, American history, the Bible, but she was isolated from much of society. When she enrolled herself in college, she began to learn about the civil rights movement and it opened her eyes to the casual racism she was surrounded with at home. Later, when she encountered the word Holocaust in her art history textbook, she raised her hand and said, I don't know this word, what does it mean? This was followed by a stunned silence from her class. Not a hush, not a muting of a noise, but utter, almost violent silence. Of course, no one could believe she didn't know what the word meant. Everyone thought she was a Holocaust denier. It's a really interesting example of how your immediate surroundings, in this case Tara's restrictive upbringing, can cause you to be so naive and ignorant about the world that you're unaware of the things you don't know that can be so much a part of other people's lives. It's an extreme version of the echo chamber and filter bubble because Tara had never come across people who had different ideas to her parents and had never been exposed to learning about things beyond what her parents thought to be important. Tara would never have learned about racism or the Holocaust had she not left the familiar surroundings of her family home. It's interesting to compare this to the online world. If you're only existing in the same sorts of spaces online, spaces in which your ideas and opinions are reinforced by people who believe the same as you and are never offered content that differs from the sort of content you've previously seen online, how can you step out into diversity, into a more accurate understanding and experience of the wider world? You probably already know that Google search is programmed to prioritise content that matches your current ideas and opinions and that is similar to the content you've previously enjoyed online, perfectly exemplifying an echo chamber and filter bubble. Furthermore, in prioritising our content, these algorithms can favour emotional over factual content. There was a big issue with YouTube a few years ago in which a technology sociologist, Zeynep Tufetshi, illustrated how recommended videos gradually and almost imperceptibly drove viewers towards more and more extreme content, slowly altering people's echo chambers to become more and more extreme versions of what they once were. Videos about jogging became videos about running ultra marathons. Videos about vaccines became videos about conspiracy theories. And videos about politics led to videos by Holocaust deniers. People's emotional responses kept them watching, kept them engaged with the platform. But over time, their emotions needed a more and more extreme kick to elicit that same level of engagement. So if you've ever wondered how a seemingly rational person can find themselves drawn into an extreme ideology or an irrational paranoia, this sort of AI driven content personalization that you get online could play a part. So what can we do to avoid consuming poor quality information and to avoid the repercussions of poor information? It might seem like the odds are stacked against you, but there are a few simple things you can do. Consider the author or the source the author is relying on. Does the author have a good professional reputation and are they an expert in the area they're reporting on? If not, have they included an expert's opinion? Is the source reliable? Are there multiple sources representing different sides to the story? 
does the author have local knowledge? Just because a journalist has witnessed an event themselves doesn't mean they understand the context within which the event is situated. Do they have deep knowledge about the local situation or community involved? Consider why the information has been created. Does it bring in diverse voices? If certain voices, ethnicities or viewpoints are missing from the news, then we're unlikely to get the full picture. What are the efforts and commitments to bringing in diverse perspectives? Are certain voices, ethnicities or political persuasions missing? Consider who might think differently. Ask yourself, what are the consequences for people in this situation? Who has power in the situation and how is that power being used to influence others? What is the relationship between this issue and others? Are the people most affected by this also affected by other things? What other stories or issues are relevant to this one? Can you find and access the sources? Is there evidence provided to support the statements made? What if there's no evidence? You might like to research the issue using different information sources. What are the similarities and differences in how the news story is being reported? Is there a mechanism for feedback? Does the publisher allow for comment? Do they publish corrections when they're wrong? Ask yourself if your own viewpoint makes you more or less likely to trust this information. If you're in class, turn to your guides from The Economist to provide further detail here. Now that's all fair and well, but these things take time and you're not likely to be able to keep up that level of analysis for everything you read, watch or listen to. So my top tip here is just do one quick thing. Check the author. Sometimes reliable sites can get it wrong. There are examples of Cambridge University Press, Science Direct and Sage journals, all well regarded academic publishers, publishing the work of racists and white supremacists. There's no one place you can guarantee to be free from fake news, racist science, disinformation or conspiracies. Sometimes your teachers, your parents or even your peers can get it wrong. And you need to be aiming to be independently able to judge these things for yourself. Sometimes you don't have a variety of sources to consult or you can't decide which viewpoint is more credible. This can be particularly common as a new story breaks or in the early days of a new finding. And sometimes you just can't trust your gut instincts or you know a provider is deliberately manipulating your instincts for commercial gain. But if you spend 30 seconds doing a quick search on the author of the information, most of the time you'll be able to very quickly assess if they're an expert in the field they're writing on, what people have thought about their past work, and if they're connected with any organisations or have any particular beliefs that might suggest a bias or an unreliable perspective. And if they don't pass your standards of credibility, then there are often plenty more sources online who will. So whether the content provider is a library, an archive, a museum, a news media outlet or digital communication company, Every individual should evaluate content based on how it is produced, the messages and values being conveyed, and the intended audiences or purposes. We've looked at this mainly from the perspective of news articles today, but the tools and techniques you've learnt about are applicable to all sorts of information, from essays to articles, YouTube videos, lectures, podcasts and official reports. I hope you feel better able to make decisions about information and more confident when assessing information sources. This has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but remember that there's plenty more guidance on the library SharePoint area.